Surgery Education Group on Facebook. I have a very exciting interview with Dr. Soda. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. We've got lots of questions to get through, so we're going to jump right into it. Yeah. Um, Fire away. We, you know, I, as I told you, I, I see spine surgeons all the time, and I always look at their resumes and their education, and yours are, yours are some of the most impressive. And just to kind of go over a little bit, you, you know, you went to MIT Biomedical, you went to Harvard in Engineering, then you decided, okay, I wanted to go to med school, John Hopkins, and you finished the Mayo Clinic in your spine residency fellowship. Um, impressive. So what made you kind of jump around and what made you finally decide to go the direction you're in now? Yeah, so I, you know, I grew up in a family um, that was very uh, engineering heavy. Um, and that's how I initially started out at MIT was pursuing biomedical engineering. And then kind of through research as an undergrad um, and, and through doing a master's, I, I found myself really gravitating more towards people. Um, and I thought that a people interfacing profession like medicine would be better. I'd be better suited for that um, than sort of lab development, R&D, PhD route. So that's how I went the MD route. And I was always interested in orthopedics, um, even as an undergrad, uh, biomechanics and just the way the body functions and human anatomy. Uh, and so I actually went into medical school thinking I would do orthopedics and then did my orthopedics ortho residency. Uh, and then the reason for spine um, really is that it of all the ortho subspecialties, you know, there's trauma, uh, joints, foot and ankle, hand. Of all the subspecialties, I found spine to be the one that really presented um, the most diagnostic challenges. Um, and it really was the most kind of problem solving of all the subspecialties because you could look at no two patients are the same. There's so many different ways to approach the same patient. If you ask 10 spine surgeons, you know, about a certain patient, you could get 10 different answers. I thought that was really cool. It really was a diagnostic dilemma um, and really uh, very problem solving based. And just coming from an engineering background, I always thought that was really cool. I also loved that the patients in spine, with so many uh, pathologies, patients get better very, very quickly. Uh, disc herniation, severe stenosis. I mean, they wake up in the PACU feeling better. I always thought that was really cool. I, I, I totally agree with you. You guys, 10 spine surgeons, we completely agree. You're going to get 10 different out, you know, outcomes to, to, to address everything. And, and you're spot on there. How did you end up winding up where you're at in Beverly Hills with Dr. Alexander Rasuli. Yeah, so I, um, when I was in a fellowship, I was at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and I sort of threw a wide net in my job search. I was looking East Coast, West Coast, everywhere. And, you know, there's a lot of criteria when you're looking for a job. I think, you know, there's location, there's, um, you know, city type, there's uh, salary, benefits. But, you know, to me, what was most important was um, who my partner would be and the mentorship. Because I think when you're early in your career, you lean on that person a lot uh, for advice to run cases by. And you sort of, you know, you need a good partner that you have a good relationship with. And I always, you know, he just always, through my job search, stood out to me as a person of a lot of integrity and character. Um, and I thought that that was number one of all my job search criteria um, that would trump location, salary, anything else. Um, so it just really stood out, you know, far and above all the other job opportunities. And it's hard in spine to, to kind of parse out, you know, practices, because there are a lot of practices and there's a spectrum, you know, um, and uh, you kind of got to do a lot of research and reconnaissance work to figure out, you know, which are the practices that have really good indications or really reliable, good outcomes. Um, and so I felt really confident about that part. I completely agree. And I, I think that's why we're talking today is because of the outcomes that, you know, Dr. Rasuli has had in the group and the outstanding work and the outstanding care. And, and that's why, you know, when I, when I heard about you and I was in the office and I was talking to Cole and he was like, Hey, we got somebody new starting. And, and, uh, I was like, Oh, this, this is going to be really cool. So, uh, very exciting for, for everybody, especially in the group, because now they got some, some options as well. 
and I know you take different payers as well, that's correct? I do, yeah, I'm in network with pretty much all the major, um, all the major players, all PPO, everybody. And then, you know, we had somebody recently in the group that came to you from Canada and you were able to work some really good pricing for them as well. So you are able to really work around international patients as well and try to, you know, help them as possible. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we really pride ourselves on sort of the, you know, customer service end and making it, you know, surgery, spine surgery is stressful enough for the patient that I think that the more we can take the onus off the patient to get details ironed out and to make it as seamless a process as possible and a good experience. So to take something very stressful and make it what they look back on as a good experience, I think is really important. Um, and I think we pride ourselves on that. And this kind of leads me to my next question. So, you know, when you're doing surgery and you're looking at scans and images, what what are you most passionate about doing in your surgery? And I'm talking about, is it more ADR based? Is it more just a, a, a broad spectrum? What, what really kind of gets you going? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, early in your career, I think it's important to remain really broad because um, I think you still want to um, you still want to become an expert, you know, in essentially everything before you refine your skills and pick out one niche. Um, and so, on, honestly, everything has been interesting to me: fusions, replacements, uh, revision, motion sparing. Um, uh, cervical, lumbar, uh, deformity, degenerative, it's all been, it's all been interesting. It's all been really, really, you know, great patients and great cases. When you were at the Mayo Clinic, what, uh, what do you think if, if surgeon would have said, Hey, we're going to do this patient, we're going to do a two or three level lumbar, two or three level cervical that we would do outpatient. And, you know, obviously I, I know you do a mixed bag of outpatient as well as inpatient. And where do you see the success kind of going as far as outpatient is concerned? Yeah, I think that there um, there are a subset of patients that are a great um, patient population for outpatient surgery. I think Mayo Clinic, Mayo is unique in that um, it is the sicker patients, you know, it's the older patients with more comorbidities, oftentimes revision surgery, big surgery, uh, it's in Rochester, Minnesota, which is, you know, more rural. Um, and it's it's people, people go there, you know, it's a tertiary care center. People go there from far and wide for very advanced care when they've kind of exhausted all other options in their community. And so just based on that, the patient population is one that is sicker and requires, you know, an inpatient stay. Um, and so we, we did very little outpatient surgery uh, there. Uh, but here, on the other hand, um, there are a lot of great patients who do wonderfully uh, with outpatient surgery, you know, um, healthier, less comorbidities, you know, one, two, maybe three levels uh, surgery. Um, but I think the important thing is to talk to the patient about the options, because uh, I think both are possible. I think what's more important to me is that the patient feel comfortable. And so what I like to say is, hey, look, here's the surgery. This can be done as an outpatient. You know, it takes an hour, hour and a half, two hours. You can go home the same day. Or if it makes you feel more comfortable, we can do it at Cedars. You can have an overnight stay. You know, I'll check on you in the morning and then you can go home. Really, I think the shared decision-making, leaving it up to the patient, telling them their options is most important because a lot of people, you know, either way is fine. Let me ask you this, and Cole might have to, to, to help us with this question because mm -hmm. it's a billing question. If a patient chooses outpatient surgery, and say you have a two or three level hybrid, what have you? across the spectrum is it easier to get approved in outpatient surgery rather than inpatient no both are both are both are, are equally straightforward you know i just know the reason why i bring it up is i know a patient went to cedar sinai to a different surgeon and, and they got their bill because they were there for five days and it was a half a million <laughs> and i'm like oh wow you know so those are some of the things that's as insurance companies, we have to kind of really know about because I, when he got that bill, somebody in the group was like, I can't believe this. I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what happens when you, when you stay there for five days and yeah. have care and food and, and you know everything else kind of done. Um, 
Have, you know, this is another big topic in the group. Have you seen osteolysis? No, I haven't. Never seen it? I haven't seen it. You know, it's it's early in my career. Um, yeah. But I have, you know, I haven't seen infections. I haven't seen osteolysis. I've seen uh, some hardware, some implant failures, um, some uh, subsidence, a little bit of loosening, but no true frank osteolysis. I have not seen. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I know great. it's I know it's out there. Yeah. Uh, so not. Um, and then the final question is, you know, obviously you've been doing spine for a while at Mayo Clinic and here, you know, and you see some complications. What's probably the biggest complication you see in ADRs and, and how do you address it? Yeah. Um, specifically in ADR surgery. Yeah, let's keep it at specific. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's how dramatic the, um, alteration is of the biomechanics. I think when you're taking an extremely collapsed disc space um, and you are restoring height and, you know, even uh, listhesis, coronal or sagittal listhesis, and you're restoring that, you know, that's a dramatic change in somebody's uh, gait biomechanics, um, you know, because really the spine, the pelvis, that's the core of your, um, of your structure. It's like the foundation of a home. Uh, and so when you're changing that, um, it takes time to relearn for your body to relearn, um, how you're going to walk certain activities, you know, the way you use the elliptical, the way you bike, the way you go on hikes. Um, and I think it, it's adapting to and accommodating that, that takes time. And I, that's why I think the post-surgical course, I tell patients it's more up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, it will not be a straight linear, you know, upward slope trajectory where every day gets better than the day before. I always tell them, you know, expect it to be an up and down, up and down, and really don't look at it day to day, each day being better than the day before, look at it week to week. So this week should be better than last week. Next week should be better than this week. That's a better barometer for judging how you're improving. Um, but I think just staying patient and staying consistent in the post-operative recovery and knowing that your body is relearning a very dramatic change, um, I think is, is important. I think that's the most common thing that comes up. Uh, but because because of that, they'll have some pain, they'll have some spasms, they might have some radicular sciatica-like symptoms. Um, but it all it all resolves. It just takes time. I think uh, that was the best answer. Uh, that's what we see, you know, and that's why we try to educate the patients in the group. That way, they're not texting you or calling you or emailing you like, "Hey, you know, I, I could barely sleep last night." Well, probably you're going to get some good sleep. It's going to be rough, and it's going to be. There's going to be peaks and valleys, just like you mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. I always tell them, you know, I bet when I talk to you in a month and exactly a month from now, you're going to be a completely different person. You just got to kind of stay the course. Yeah. You got to stay the course, you know, keep, keep the directions going, keep walking, keep doing all the different things that you guys advise them to do and, and, and take that direction. Um, so I, I, you know, like I said, that's a big part of the group because a lot of people, that you know just like brett that came from canada he's like i'm having some muscle spasms and more but you know because he's watched the group so well and he's listened to smart educated people like yourself he's like i know it's going to get better and and that's what we're just trying to achieve that way people aren't driving everybody crazy aren't driving cold crazy and everything like that and uh yeah. Perfect, perfect answer. And, and staying, staying optimistic and positive. You know, that's a big part of it. The mindset um, that just keeps you on course and a recovery. Uh, I, you know, that's another thing that we talk about mindset because, and me and, and Reeve talked about that the other day. Is like, hey, I said we, we want to stop the patient from not having to be sent home because that happens, right? You know, blood pressure is high. They ate something within four hours ago, so we're trying to all educate. That way, it's a smooth pathway for, for yourself. You're getting the patient in, and there's no complications. The patient's out. They're having some peaks and valleys. And in three months, they're doing fantastic. Yeah. And, and I think that you definitely proved that in your practice with all your education and your background. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today because I know a lot of people are going to be looking forward to, to seeing this video. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to talking to you. I appreciate yeah. it. Same here. Okay.